So we've been taking a minute, and um, I told you a couple weeks ago, we, we sat around uh, in, in service planning meeting. We were talking about um, ideas and stuff, and, and one, one person in the meeting says, you know what, why, why don't you just take a minute and answer some of these questions that come up from time to time, and people begin to talk about it. And I said, all right, that's, that's a great idea. Who should do it? Um, because, you know, when you start answering questions, then it, it begins to open things up. And I don't really want to answer the questions as much as I want to think about some of the ways in which we approach these topics. Because how we approach them and how we think about them is, is tough. And so today we're going we're gonna to dive into one that is, I mean, they've all been challenging. This one's super challenging too. And this is one that I think people are afraid to ask. And I think the reason they're afraid to ask it is because what does it say about me if I ask this question? What does it say about my faith or lack of faith if I ask this question? And so I think it's probably okay if we just kind of open this one up today where we look at this and it's, why hasn't God answered my prayer? I prayed. Why hasn't he answered my, my prayer? And, and some of us, you got into a relationship with God and you prayed the prayer and you're like, I'm gonna be a follower of Jesus and I wasn't, but now I'm gonna ch- kind of change some things in my life. And then you started coming to church and after you started coming to church, then you started praying. Some of you have started writing things and you've been putting them to the cross. Some of you have submitted prayer requests. And then now you've been at this long enough where you've heard other people say, they're, they're given stories about then they prayed and then this happened, and you're like, wow, that's amazing, and God changed their life, or God healed their mother, and you're like, this is incredible. Then you hear somebody else, and they, they prayed, and God gave them a front row parking space at Target when it was raining, and you're like, wow, man, what a God you serve. That's thinking, and you're like, this sounds great. And some of you have been watching this going, man, that sounds great, and you're thinking, I don't know, though. I don't know. I'm going to try praying. Because the last time you tried praying, it didn't go so well, right? It seemed like God didn't even hear you. So you started to wonder, did I do this right? Like, did I I say this? And maybe you got answered it, but it wasn't the answer you wanted. So then it's like, well, God, you didn't answer this the way I wanted to. So maybe then what did I do wrong that you're not asking me this way? And you're wondering, okay, does, does God not hear me? Or does God not answer me? Or is God good? Is God great? Because some of you are taught, you know, God is good, God is great. Let us thank him for our food, amen. You're like, I don't know if he's good or great. He's average. And you begin to wonder these questions and see, to begin to think that or wonder that, it, it, you start to go, what's wrong with me? Because this person's raving about God, and I'm like, eh, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. And for any of you who's ever had one of those questions where you go, God, I just want you to know before we kind of jump into this today, I'm with you. I've thought those things. I've wondered those things. So I know you've thought from time to time, like, am I using the right combination of words? Because some people, man, they got great combination of words in their prayers, and you're like, wow, that was awesome. That sounded fantastic. Do I need to, to work better on that? Am I not saying the right words in the right way? Am I not saying them with enough sincerity? Do I need to say some more Our Fathers? Or am I need to say some more Hail Marys? Or do I need to have, you know, do I need to beg more intensely? Do I need to, you know, lay down on the ground with my face on the floor? How, how does this begin to go? Do I need to say pretty please to God? I mean, like, maybe I'm not polite enough to God. Maybe that's why I'm not getting the answers that I have. Maybe, God, maybe it's like I, I've tried calling God and I've said, God, please hear this prayer, and he's not calling me back, and I made the request, but you're not calling back, and if you felt that way, and you've wondered, you know, you talked about this, and, and it's been, it's kind of a private thing, isn't it? Why didn't God answer my prayer? It, or, or this, is there something I'm supposed to do after I say amen, or do I just click send? Amen. Now, what do I do now? Is it like Amazon where I just sit by the door and go, it'll be here any day. <laughs> Look at this. This is so fast. I mean, how does this work? And here's what I found. Usually every Sunday I'm either standing in the back or I'll head out into the lobby and I'll just stand there. And when people are done, they'll, inevitably people will come and talk to me because you're friendly, right? And so that's nice. And they'll, they'll come talk and, and they'll tell me something. You'll tell me something that's going on in your life. A lot of times you'll tell me something that's really difficult going on, and then sometimes this will happen too. A lot of times this will happen. And you'll say this. This is what's going on in my life. This is really heavy. This is really hard. And you'll say, will you pray for me? And a lot of times I'll tell you what. Absolutely. And I'll say this too. Well, you, you can pray too. 
Now, I mean, I'm happy to pray with you, but you can pray too. And a lot of times I'll get this, oh, well, yeah, but God, I don't think God listens to me. I feel like maybe my chances are higher if you help, <laughs> right? Because don't you kind of work for him in some sort of pseudo way? So maybe you've got like a better access to this and, and maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe you're like in the, 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 how the workflow works, maybe you got better access or how many prayers do you get a month that get, you know, preferential treatment or how does this work? And, and it's like, for many of us, it feels like we sent God this text, right? Have you ever, you've done this, I know you have. You sent God this, you feel like you sent God a text and you sent it and you click send and all of a sudden you see the other person, if you have an Apple phone, right? iPhone, you see the little three dots go and you're like, oh, they're replying. Does this happen to you and you're like, text somebody and you're like, ooh, they're replying. And then the little dots go away and nothing. And then what do you start doing? Well, I know they got it. I know they're thinking about it. Maybe I need to send a text again. It's been a day. It's been two days. Maybe this time I need to put some punctuation after it. Maybe I need it up with an emoji. Maybe a GIF will help get this other person's attention. And some of you have, have kind of wondered about stuff like this. So several years ago, it's been a few years ago, I decided I kind of wanted to get to the bottom of this. I was real curious about this whole prayer thing. And I had some prayers, some big prayers that did not get answered in the way that I wanted. In fact, I felt ignored, felt alone. I was praying for healing and found myself at a funeral. Some of you have been there. And I, 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 there's a lot of books about how to pray. I mean, a lot of books. I've read a lot of them. Listen to a lot of podcasts. Listen to a lot of audio books on this about how to pray. And I started looking into this and started wondering and took some classes on it and how to pray and all these kinds of things. And there's, there's a lot of information about there on how to pray. But what there's not really much information on is what do you do after you pray? What are you supposed to do when you're waiting? After you've prayed. So this morning I want to get into this. And I want to look at Jesus because that's what we do here, right? And I want to look at how he responds to this. And the interaction that Jesus has with people after they've made a request of him. And their prayer request. And, and their request for their life. And I mean the essence of their prayers where Jesus, will you hear my, heal my son? Will you, will you heal me? Now, just so you're clear, every week we have a variety of prayers that are submitted, a lot of prayers that are submitted each week on the cross, and they're in a few categories. There's like the health prayers, and then we have like the job prayers, and we have the anxiety prayers, and we have the relationship prayers, we have the finance prayers, we have the addiction prayers, and all of these kinds of things. And so today, I'm not going to get into the health prayers particularly on this one and like, you know, God heal and all this, because honestly, I don't, I don't fully understand why God heals some people and why he doesn't in some places. Uh, we'll save that for another time. Today, I want to kind of focus on the other prayers, the prayers that are like, God, will you fix this? God, will you change this? Because very rarely, and I mean rarely, Jesus says, sure, sure, let's take a look at this. Bam, done. And though there's several things that, that when we ask God to do things, and what do we do, how do we wait after we say amen? And if you're somebody who thinks, man, I've been a Christian for a long time and I've been praying for a long time, this may be the one thing you need to hear this morning, and I'm so glad you're here or watching online, because sometimes you're afraid to pray because you're scared. You're scared of what might happen if you got vulnerable and prayed. I understand that. I understand that. So today, what do we do after we make a request to God, what do we do while we wait on God? So this story today comes from uh, John. John was an eyewitness of everything that Jesus uh, did, taught, said. He spent an enormous amount of time with Jesus' mom after Jesus ascended into heaven. And after Jesus ascended, John took care of Mary. Um, and he writes all this stuff down years after um, he was there. He, he knew Jesus. Uh, this, this story takes place Joseph, Jesus' father, earthly father, had died. Uh, we're, we're now in, in a situation where people around him knew, hey, this is Jesus. His dad was a carpenter. That's Mary. That's his mom. This is the kid from Nazareth up there. And we're, we find ourselves in this little village not too far away from Cana. Not many people know who Jesus actually is. Mary knows that Jesus is the son of God uh, because she had an angel 
say uh, so, and she's been around him his whole life. You have John the Baptist, who's still alive at this time, and he knows that Jesus is the Son of God. You have some followers, and they're mostly skeptical, going, <laughs> All right, well, we'll see. It's a rabbi, and I wasn't smart enough to be picked by some of the other rabbis, and this rabbi said I could follow him, so I wanna, I wanna kinda go around there and begin to go this, but most are skeptical. There's about two people that really know this is the Son of God, John the Baptist and Mary, his mother. Everybody else is sort of all on the fence. They all agree. The guy tells amazing stories. He's a wonderful storyteller, and they're along for the ride. And, and people begin to look at them, and so this, this story begins to go, and we have this first miracle of Jesus, and it takes place in John chapter two, and it's at a wedding. It's at a wedding, and they get invited, the disciples get invited to the wedding, and let, let's be honest, guys, can we be honest, when your wife leans over and goes, hey, we just got invited to a wedding, what's your first thought? I mean, I'll be honest, my first thought is, ooh, which college football game am I gonna miss, right? I don't know, well, I don't know, I don't, we may not be able to make that one, right? And so we get this, but back then, people wanted to go to weddings. They, they lasted for days, they were celebrations, and many times, people were entrusted to bring supplies. They would often be like potluck, and so, hey, you bring this, you bring this, you'll bring this, and together we'll have this ceremony, it'll go for several days. And Jesus was there with his disciples, and they all probably brought something with them. And so I wanna look at this interaction here today, because it's really gonna, there's some requests in here, and Jesus responds to this quest, and I think it's going to have really high value for us here today. So, John chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day of the week, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee, and Jesus' mother was there, Mary. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Now, Mary comes to Jesus and says, first, I think they're going to be out of wine. And I, that would have been a really big deal back then. In fact, you in Israel back at the time, you can file a lawsuit against the family if they run out of wine during a wedding for this. And so Mary's request, Mary's prayer, Mary's ask of Jesus is fascinating. And took a lo take a look at what John um, replies here. John writes this reply down, and I think it's fascinating. Jesus looks at his mom and says, woman. Why do you involve me? This ain't my problem. Wasn't on my list, not my to-do. Jesus says, my hour has not come. And Jesus says, dear woman, that's not my problem. Now, we have talked about proof texting two weeks ago and we talked about the Bible. So I wanna talk to all of the middle school and high school um, students here in the room today. Thinking that the next time your mom asks you to do something that you can quote this verse. This is one of those try it and find out. <laughs> Let me just remind you, you're not Jesus. <laughs> Nobody is confusing you to be the son of God or the daughter of God, okay? So Jesus looks at his mom and says, I don't think you need to involve me. So if your mom goes, you need to clean your room. Ah, uh, you don't need to involve me. This is not my problem, mom. <laughs> my time has not come. That is what we call proof text. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. I just want to give you another example. You can stick that in your hat, okay? But please don't do that. And parents, if they do that, feel free. I mean, you know, spare the rod. There you go. <laughs> but when you look at the original language of this the text, what he's actually saying is, is ma'am, ma'am, respect. My time hasn't come, and this miracle, it's not time for it. I heard what you said, but it's not time for an answer to this request. People don't know who I am yet and, and where that leaves it. I don't know where this goes, but he says Mary just kind of pushes back a little bit like all moms to their kids. But here's what Mary does know. Here's what Mary did. Mary did not feel the need to repeat the question. Mary also, so moms and dads listen to this one. Mary also did not say, did you hear what I said, son? Doesn't say that. Mary doesn't repeat the question. She already said what she needed to say. She does not feel the need. She does not feel the need to beg her son to do this. She didn't know what it was. Instead, this is what Mary does. This is fascinating. We gotta pay attention to this. This is so great, so great. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, this, this whole passage, I'd consider it if I were you, if you're on the fence. This is so good. His mother said to the servants, doesn't talk to Jesus again. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. I don't know what he's gonna do. 
but I know you can trust what he says. I don't know how he's going to resolve it. He may do nothing. But if he does something, you need to do whatever he tells you to do. Sometimes when I do weddings, I'll walk through this story and I'll look at the couple and I'll say, do you want to know the secret to a great marriage? Just do whatever Jesus tells you to do. Love like Jesus. Forgive like Jesus. Serve like Jesus. Do whatever he tells you to do. And then after Mary says this, she walks away. She has no idea how her prayer is going to be answered. She doesn't know if her prayer will be answered, but she knows and she has told the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. And I don't know if there's a gap. I don't know if what happens in the next moment. I'm not sure what t- takes place. But we pick up the story, verse 6. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each one holding 20 to 30 gallons, so 20 to 30 gallons times six. That's a lot. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Now, these are ceremonial washing. They're symbolic because they would be for, used for Jewish people to cleanse themselves so they're able to go and stand before God, pray before God, do all this kind of stuff. Now, spoiler alert, all of this is going to get turned into wine. So I don't know how, you know what your beverage looks like needs for your wedding, but this is a lot. And keep in mind, they already ran out around one. And Jesus notices these big, huge jars for ceremonial washing over there. They're huge. And Jesus tells the servant, go fill them with water. Now, when I read this thing for the first time, I think, go get the hose, put the hose in the container, turn it on, and wait there for a few minutes. But that's not what it was. This took multiple people gathering these huge stone jars, and you're carrying them down to the river. So now they weigh, you're filling them up in the river. Now they weigh about 300 pounds. Multiple servants carrying these in the heat, dressed for a wedding, and they do this six times. Six times they go down, fill this thing up, and it's not like your little, you know, garden pail. This massive amount of work to fill this thing up. Maybe they took it down, took buckets. I don't know how they did it, but they filled them up, and they had to carry them back up. And these guys had to be thinking... What are we doing? I didn't even want to come to this wedding. And now I got to go fill up water out of these things and dragging these 300-pound jars of water around. And they're not seeing any of this turned into wine. It's just water, river water, six different times. And when the jars had been filled, in other words, when it was all done, not their first trip, not their second trip to the river, not their third trip, after the sixth trip down to the river... When it's finished, verse 8, then he told them. I mean, they all got to be panting. There's no way they're not. Told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. So the servants followed his instructions. And when the master of ceremonies tasted that the water was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though, of course, the servants knew. (laughs) They were like, huh. He called the bridegroom over. The host always serves the best wine first, he said, and then everybody had a lot to drink. He brings out the cheap stuff because nobody will know the difference after they've had a few glasses. You won't know if it's cheap stuff or the expensive stuff. This guy just brought out the best. So verse 11, we begin to go after they've had the best brought out. John writes this down. He says, what Jesus did here in Canaan and Galilee was the first of signs through which he revealed his glory and the disciples believed in him. Him. The story of Jesus turning water into wine tells me this simple truth about God, that God is faithful, not just while we wait, but while we work. In other words, the blessing, the answer didn't come, the miracle didn't come until after the work was done. Could it be to your prayers and to my prayers, some of us are a little early. Maybe you've only made two or three trips to the river. And you're going, God, where are you? 
Author and speaker Mark Batterson says this. Sometimes before God does the super, super, he's waiting on us to do the natural. Isn't it true when you pray, you're wanting God to do the supernatural? God, I need a miracle here. I need the supernatural. Maybe what Jesus is trying to let us know in here is don't stop praying, but don't only pray. And what we're challenged with here is, are you filling up the jugs with water? Are you preparing for the natural? Or are you just waiting on the super? So let's bring it down to the things I see written on the cross each and every week. In your marriage, are you just waiting for the super? Or are you grabbing the basin, heading down to the river, and doing the hard work? With the natural, in your job, in your job. Are you just waiting on the super? In your finances, are you just waiting for the super? <laughs> My grandpa did that. My grandpa passed when I was in high school, and every year uh, he would fill out the publisher's clearinghouse. <clears throat> yeah, mail it in. This could be the year. Great. A couple times a month, he'd, he'd buy his Illinois lottery ticket. What's that? He's waiting on the super. So if you were talking with my grandpa um, and you were to say, hey, you're waiting on the supernatural. You're just waiting on the super. What would it look like for him? What advice would you give him? What would it look like for him to work on the natural with his finances rather than just waiting on the supernatural? In other words, keep working while you're waiting. Keep working while you're waiting. I know this is true. I mean, if you've got a small business and it's going well and you want to open up a second branch, you don't shut down the first one to go do the other. You keep working while you're waiting on the next one. True? You know this is true in your relationships as well. If you want to get better, you want to be putting the work in, eventually you'll begin to see the results of this. I mean, if, if you have a kid who's working on their homework and they worked on their homework and your daughter aces an algebra test and she's a freshman in high school, you don't pull her out of school at that moment and go take her over to NASA and go, I think she's ready. She's ready. She got an A on this algebra test. I think she's ready. No, you keep working and you keep working until you're prepared for what's next. You keep working and you keep working until you're prepared for next. what's next. God may not answer your prayer if you're not prepared for what's next. You keep working. And the same is true when you're praying. You keep praying and you keep working. God's preparing you for this moment. The silence does not mean that God didn't hear you. It just means he's waiting for some things in your character to change. It's waiting for you to get to the point where you can handle some of the capacity of his answer. And while you're working, you're waiting. Now, God, you pray, God, I'd, I'd like for you to fill in the blank. That's your prayer, right? Right? God, I really need this to take place in my life right now. This is my prayer. In the meantime, you keep working, you keep trying, you keep forgiving, you keep preparing, you keep, like we talked about last week, you keep looking in the mirror, asking God to point out the plank in your own eye. God, what's the plank in my own eye? Because isn't it true? When you write a prayer request up for a relationship, what are you asking God to do? Fix them. And while you're praying, you need to be working. Dear God, I'd like to have a new career, but until then, I'll, I keep the job I have and I'll keep working as if I'm working for you, God. My boss, he's such a, right, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep working, I'm gonna keep preparing, I'm gonna keep getting better at what I do as if I'm working for you, God. God, I'd like for my adult kids to forgive me for the horrible parent I was, but until then, I'm gonna work on who I am for this point. God, in my marriage, I want my spouse to start coming to church, but then I'll keep serving and doing exactly what Jesus does. We had a, we had a woman who attends church here. Um, I don't know if she's here or not today, but, but she had, was coming to church and she wanted her husband to come to church with her. She wanted her, she kept coming faithfully every week. She wanted her husband to come to church with her and he wasn't interested at all. 
So she decided to stop coming to church, and she started watching from online at home. And she'd sit next to him wherever he was on a Sunday morning and open up her laptop and start watching on the service. Not in an obnoxious kind of way, but just like, a, oh, yeah, sit down. Oh, turn on church service. And for a while, after a while, he started looking over her shoulder. After a while, he said, all right, then look terrible. I can tolerate that. I'll go with you. What do you do? You keep working while you're waiting. You go get in line. You keep going back to the river. You go back to the river. You haul the jug back to the river. You fill it up because God's not finished with you yet, and there's things that he wants to do in you. God's waiting to do the super when you've done the natural things, waiting for you to grow, and you've begun to be a part of this and receiving the answer. But when we get to see God's work, it's not just about waiting. So when you're looking for a new job or if you're still single and you don't understand that and when you're stuck in some addiction and you really want to be forgiven what you've done and you really want reconciliation to be back and you really need somebody to forgive you don't just wait on the super god may do the super but you really need to invest in the natural and we got a bunch of marriage requests every week many of them pray for the super usually it results in blaming other people and excusing themselves blaming others We have a lot of people in their finances praying on the super. Now, I've gone to the mailbox, and I'll tell you, I've seen the super happen. But I've also seen the natural work where you reduce your spending, getting rid of extras, having hard hard financial conversations. A lot of prayers about anxiety. While waiting on the super, change your screen habits, your bedtime routine, your breathing, go for walks which is to say you need to do the next right thing. Just focus on doing the next right thing. That's what you do when you're waiting on your prayer. You do the next right thing. And then if God decides to part the Red Seas in a miraculous thing, you give him thanks and praise. But in the meantime, you keep loving your spouse. You keep going to church. You keep tithing. You keep serving. You keep doing the little things, and over time, it catches up to you. The little things catch up to you. For all you sports fans out there, there's this great book out there by an old coach. His name was Bill Walsh from the San Francisco 49ers. It's called The Score Takes Care of Itself. And the whole concept of the book was that we're going to work on blocking and tackling and executing perfectly, and the score will just figure itself out. He was pretty good. I think the same thing is true when it comes to our faith. We keep doing the little things over and over and over, and eventually the miracles catch up to us. The Apostle Paul, St. Paul, the Apostle Paul, Waited 12 years before his commissioning to happen to ministry. Joseph in the Old Testament waited 18 years in prison. What did he do while he was waiting for that prayer to be answered? I bet you he thought, God, after year 16, God, my Lord, how many times do I got to keep going down to the river here? He was faithful day after day after day. The people of God waited over 400 years for the Messiah to come. God's timetable, I'm just going to tell you, is often very different than ours. But God has heard your prayer. Two quick stories. We were at another church. We were in South Carolina, and there was a woman who she didn't know it at the time, but she was basically a mail-order bride from another country. Her husband would drink a lot, and so he was usually hung over on Sunday morning. She grew up in a country that values atheism, But she started walking up the hill to our church, and she walked into the church doors, um, not believing, not thinking it was just a safe place where she could see people, because basically she was trapped in an apartment down the hill. She started coming over time and began to get involved and began to have her own story of faith, and uh, she was praying for a miracle, but she kept working and working and working and working, and one day there was a group of guys, the police had to stay outside, there was a group of guys, it was on a... On an early morning, her husband was drunk again, and we went in and we helped extract her from the situation. There were boxes to the ceiling, and she was sleeping in the front room of the apartment on, a, on an old army cot. She had a hot pot right next to it. We got her out. We got her into a safe house. Her life is transformed now. She works for her family business back, back there. What happened? 
her faithfulness over time. And then God chimed in with the super. There was another guy named Anthony. We ought to have Anthony come sometime. He was a police officer, state trooper in South Carolina. Got caught. <clears throat> he was taking bribes for helping drug runners go up and down the state of South Carolina. He got caught, was prosecuted, went to prison for several years. While in prison, found the Lord, came out, started attending our church, and got to know Anthony over time. God began to transform his life. He started working with the teens in the youth group, started working in the school system, started a nonprofit. This May, uh, Anthony will graduate from Northwest Nazarene with a master's degree in family ministries. God will do the super. Sometimes we just have to keep in the natural. So on your prayers, my wife is reading this book on prayer right now, and she talks about sometimes we get, sometimes we get passive aggressive in our prayers, a little bit judgmental in, in our prayers. Listen to your prayers sometimes. Have you ever prayed this? God, stop from being a jerk. God, help us. You ever prayed this at dinner? God, help us all around the table to be more patient. What are you actually saying? A bunch of insensitive jerks. Oh, God, spiritually help us, right? I think one of the things I've learned, many things from Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers always would just say the name. He would just say, God, and be with Bob. Be with Mark. Be with Matt. God, you know them. You know what they need. I'm not going to tell you what they need. Versus, God, uh, help Matt be less of a jerk. <laughs> so God, be with Matt. Be with the way that I see Matt. Obviously, I can pick on Matt. We've been friends for ever. And maybe this morning God is saying to you and to your situation and your job and your finances and your marriage and your relationships with your kids or your spouse. I want to do the supernatural in your life, but for now you need to go, go grab a jug and head to the river. How many times have I got to do this? I don't know. There's another jar. Head to the river. How many times have I got to do this? That while we're waiting on God to do the super. Let's work hard on the natural. Father, today, we all are carrying something that we just need help. If we could do it ourselves, we'd do it. Sometimes our prayers are blame prayers. Sometimes our prayers are others-focused prayers. But God, today, would you help us to, yes, yes, we believe in the supernatural. But while we wait on the super, would you help us to engage in the natural? Help us just not to throw up our hands, but would you help us to just engage in your redemptive work help us to focus on the plank in our own eye help us to spend more time in the mirror asking questions about god what is it about my heart that needs to be changed what is it about my attitude what is it about the way that i talk to others that needs to change rather than us focusing on others so god today as we sing songs to you and about you maybe we want to write some new prayers today and get to work on the natural and wait. Let's work while we wait for you to do that which only you can do. Help us to be responsible to go grab the jar and head to the river. And who knows what you may do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today online. If you enjoyed the content you saw today, we really think you might like being here in person with us at Gathering Point. And we have environments on Sunday for your elementary students, your preschoolers, and our nursery is open as well. So you can get all the information about joining us here in person at our website, gatheringpoint.church. We can't wait to see you soon.